Nestled throughout Britain, there are extraordinary garden sanctuaries. Where nature provides harmonious spaces to relax, unwind, and reflect. It is extraordinary. I mean, out of the spring, this, this great thing has just evolved. They're places where we can appreciate the beauty, form and bounty of the natural world. Just amazing. The rhythms of the season root us to the land. Here we are in the midst of Eden. Picking apples. Walk around any garden and you will instantly sense that it is all about hope and expectation. So unsurprisingly, gardens have always been thought of as spiritual places, spaces that nourish our hearts and souls. And in my work as a garden designer, that's what I'm after, mini paradises. After all, as the poet says, one's nearer to God's heart in a garden than anywhere else on earth. I think we often forget how key the garden is to the Easter story. And in these unprecedented times, there's all the more reason to look to the messages at the heart of Easter for hope and inspiration. So to celebrate this year, we're going to be visiting some of our most spectacular heavenly gardens. It's Easter Sunday, the day Christians celebrate the resurrection of Christ, his triumph over death and the promise of eternal life. It's a joyful day. So later on, I'm going to be visiting a garden whose sole aim is joy and healing. And Arid visits a magnificent Scottish palace using modern technology to resurrect their ancient trees. Moment of truth, let's see how you're doing. But we start with a garden that celebrates the gift of life itself, the element that makes life possible, water. Just 20 miles south of Bristol, I've come to explore the Bishop's Palace in the city of Wells. The palace sits in the shadow of the mighty Wells Cathedral and is home to the Bishop of Bath and Wells. But it's the garden that holds the secret to the city's existence. This, of course, is what gives this place its name, Wells. Of course, that's why it's called Wells. All around here, the water runs off the Mendip Hills and it forces itself up through the rocks and emerges just like this in pure springs. Of course, without water, there's no life. Without water, there is no garden. So this seems a perfect place to start for Easter Sunday. This has endured as a site of worship since Roman times. Today, 14 acres of glorious gardens spill out around the springs to create the Bishop's Palace Garden. It's a sacred place, and to discover more about the significance of water and gardens in the Christian story, I've come to meet the current palace resident, Bishop Peter Hancock. Well, here we are in the beautiful gardens at Wells Cathedral. Um, tell us about this particular garden. Um, well, the, the, the city of Wells gets its name from the Wells, and the reason why this glorious cathedral is here um, is because there's been water flowing here for centuries, night and day, winter and summer, uh, year by year, through the centuries. And wherever water is, life follows. Those beautiful parts of our isles are those where the rain lashes most of the time. But also, I suppose, water has its relevance in, in the Christian, in one thinks of uh, baptism. As you say, uh, water is a symbol of life, it's a symbol of being made clean, of forgiveness, uh, new life, new hope, all comes through uh, the story of, of Jesus and baptism. Walking around a garden like this, it's very easy to feel what the spiritual benefit of a garden is. But actually a garden 
or gardens play a very important part in the Christian story, don't they? They do. I mean, it all begins in a garden with Adam and Eve. But actually, for Jesus, gardens were also important. Uh, it was at the Garden of Gethsemane that he went to pray the night before he was crucified, the night before he went to the cross. Um, and then, of course, it's in a garden on Easter morning when Mary finds who someone she thinks is a gardener, uh, and actually it's risen Jesus uh, back from the dead. So it's in a garden where that new story, new life, new hope for the world begins. And there's yes. something about the gardens where we are, uh, gardens that people have at home, gardens that we love. Uh, they bring a peace to our heart, and it's a place sometimes mm. where uh, we can... We can think about the big questions of life, but also somewhere where often people find the presence of God really uh, alongside them and with them. The lush green landscape surrounding the wells is evidence of the life-giving power of water, which spills out into the surrounding moat. But it's a precious commodity that requires careful management. Today, I've come to lend a hand to head gardener, James Cross and his team, as they tend to one of the garden's water features. So what are you doing there, James? I'm opening the sluice gate to lower the water uh -huh. so we can uh, clear off this chase down to the waterfall. I see. Clear some of the weed away. As the water drops from the channel, our task is revealed a build-up of weed that the team clears twice a year to maintain a good flow of water. Well now, so to work. Oh, it's not too deep, is it? I see, it's just that. And the idea is just to get rid of all this, all this That's weed. That's it, it clears this, this weed away here. Get a finish yep. more like this here where it hasn't grown. And if, you, if you're sort of chopping it off like that, somebody else will come along and sweep it further down. And then every now and again, just collect it. <laughs> Are you always keeping an eye on the levels while you're here? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And if it comes up too far, we then know we can adjust from the sluice gate there, the level going through. Yeah. Otherwise, this place would be flooded. Yeah, I'm not surprised. That's central to why the garden is such a fertile and Which really wonderful. Which wonderful, yeah, absolutely. The water around here creates such a wonderful atmosphere. It's a yeah. very, very, very calming place to work. It's funny, I think of gardening sometimes as being rather a solitary. It's a wonderful and very nourishing thing to do, but it, it can sometimes be solitary. My parents always tend to sort of do their gardening at different ends of the garden, you know, but doing it together like this, as sort of a communal experience, that must, be a, that must be a lovely thing. It creates a family feeling. We feel part of a family in here. It's a wonderful place to be. And for me, as a, as a full-time gardener, I meet people, different people every day who volunteer and that creates great friendships, and we're able to work together in a very harmonious way throughout the year. OK, well, I think that's just about it. So we can close the sluice gate now, and it'll take okay. the last bits down. Just wash it all away. Wash it away, yep. There really is nothing to beat the sense of satisfaction and a job well done, some communal work. And in these beautiful surroundings, there's just a tremendous sense of fulfillment. There it goes. Swept It'll away, take it. rolling away. Ah, oh, it's very satisfying. Being surrounded by this water is just magical. Not only is water a metaphor for life, but there literally is life and new life growing in a garden all the time, just like this weed. Of course, this is not the only holy place, or indeed the only holy well in Somerset. Just six miles away is the magical and mystical Glastonbury Tor, where Aritz found another sacred spring. In the shadow of the hill is the enchanting White Spring of Glastonbury, where I've come to meet Professor Ronald Hutton. Harriet. I want to know why wells like this have been sacred for centuries. You welcome to the White Spring of Glastonbury. <laughs> it is quite amazing, but tell me what goes on here. The White Springs a spiritual centre in Glastonbury that's really blossomed over the last 20 years. It's one of two natural springs that come out of the foot of Glastonbury Tor, and this water has been flowing for thousands and thousands of years. Wow. 
back in ancient times, you know, how really was this sort of revered? Well, springs have three reasons for being special. Okay. First is that they're regarded as gateways. They're ways of getting from our world to the world of goddesses and gods and spirits. Second is, they're often thought to be the homes of goddesses and spirits. Third thing is, they often contain healing powers. They have mineral salts that are actually good for the body and the health. And all those are concentrated here in Glastonbury. And what goes on inside this lovely place in here? There are a number of shrines where people can invoke or pray to their saints or spirits or goddesses or gods. And there are two pools, so you can actually uh, take a bath in here as well as engage in worship. Okay. And people actually do go in and bathe? Oh, they do, regularly. I'm eager to explore the dark and mysterious well house myself and feel the energy of the white spring that's never dried up. The pools aren't very appealing on a chilly day like today, but I can't resist taking a dip, with my hands anyway. Wow, a really, really interesting experience. It's absolutely amazing in there, feeling the power and force of that water coming out from the spring and knowing that that's been happening for thousands of years and that it's been attracting people with creating shrines and, and really feeling the healing benefits and the basically being in the flow of life. So I guess it would be rude of me not to go and capture some of that magic. Well, it certainly tastes divine. Mm -hmm. Clean, pure water like this is so symbolic. It conveys healing and redemption. But I think above all, it's about life. At the Bishop's Palace, I found a gardening task that also expresses this metaphor. Resident gardener James Cross is putting me through my paces in a dahlia bed. OK. Show me what to do here. OK, so we're deadheading this dahlia and okay. just taking off the dead flowers or the flowers that have gone to seed, like okay. this one. OK. So we'll take and those take down. Down to the sort of next... The next sort of join, joint. really. Yeah. Okay. And even lower than that if we need okay. to. OK, OK. So what kind of dahlias are these? This is Bishop of Landaff. Yeah. Um, there's a number of dahlias in the garden named after bishops. Is, is there a Bath and Wells? There must be, surely. There's actually... A Bishop Peter Price, who was the previous bishop, that's the only one named after a specific bishop, I believe. What has been your, your scheme generally for the, for the larger canvas? Well, we were quite fortunate because I have had a fairly free hand in the development of yeah. the gardens, because we know there were medieval gardens here, but we don't have a lot on those, mm. and there's not much archive material, probably because the bishops come and go, so that they take a lot of information with them, couple of sketches and then not a lot until the, you get to the Victorian photographs. The urn, seen in both pictures, still sits in the centre of the garden. And there's another element that James has wanted to keep, the formal hedges surrounding the flower beds. There was box hedging here, but that got box done for it. That's it, the box So what, what is it? it? I mean, it looks, it looks like a sort of giant box. What is it? It is, and I think it looks better than box most of the year. It's Euonymus, and there's Euonymus Green Rocket and Euonymus Jean Hughes, and they're the best replacements for box when you've had blight, really. Um, did you follow a particular religious philosophy when you were planning the garden? Is there any...? Well, certainly certain elements of the garden have been, particularly the, the newer contemporary garden, Parts of that reflect the stained glass in the cathedral. And then you've also got a, a big white sculpture that you can go into and sit within to pray quietly or, or reflect. And do you know what? I mean, as we're doing this, I'm just thinking there is a kind of religious angle on what we're doing now. Deadheading, of course, you're taking away. It's all about new life, isn't it? It is, yeah. Renewing. It always amazes us how quickly everything sprouts up again yeah. and shoots up yeah. and fills the space.
For me, gardens and plants provide a perfect meditation on rebirth and new life as we move through the natural cycles of the year. And it's not just the Christian calendar that celebrates gardens and new life at this time of year. It's also part of an older pagan tradition, as Arit is finding out. I've come to a community-run orchard in Carampton near Taunton to meet Keith Jones. He's preparing a Bramley apple tree for its starring role in tonight's ceremony, which is all about celebrating the changing of the seasons and looking ahead to good health and a good harvest. It's a raucous affair called a wassail. This is my first ever wassail. Is it? Yeah, really? and, I, and I'm not quite sure that I know exactly what I'm wassailing or what, what wassailing is. So Give me a bit more, Keith, about um, it. Well, it, we will be here to encourage the tree to wake up and produce a wonderful harvest uh, for which we sing to it. Some, oh. some uh, apple trees we've sung to death, I'm afraid. <laughs> but oh. in the end, we hope for a, for a good harvest and we had a wonderful harvest last year. What I love is the fact that this lovely natural spot with these fabulous trees mm. pulls the, the, the community, pulls the village yeah. together. Yes, yes. Yeah. And I think this wassailing, in which you're relating to the tree, is a kind of a, a transaction which can be seen as a, as a good sign. I mean, there's been a terrific growth of interest in wassail. I'm surprised you haven't been to one so far. Well, really. I, I, this, will, this will be my initiation, but I shall know <laughs> what to do next time round. But ultimately, I think it's a moment to actually respect the fact that this tree mm. is going to give bountiful yes, fruit. Yes, yes. Yeah. And I think it's a sign of hope that we are showing more interest in nature creatively, um, as we are learning we need to do in order to survive even, don't we? So yeah. that's an important part of it for me. Well, it's a, it's a lovely way of bringing nature and people together. Yeah. Best get these lights up, I guess, I think so. really. Now that the tree's ready and a fire has been lit, the community is gathered together in the orchard to begin the annual wassail. Keith kicks off tonight's proceedings. It tells them, yes, it's on. It only costs 12 quid. It is my pleasurable duty to welcome you all to our annual Carhampton Community Orchard Wassail. To encourage good spirits, cider soaked toast is placed in the tree's branches. These are high rolling. shouting, banging and guns scare the evil spirits away. Now we can do the wassail, won't we? Old apple tree we want. But it's our energetic singing that we hope will raise the tree from its winter slumber and encourage a bountiful harvest. I challenge anyone to sleep through this. Hey! Old apple tree we wassail thee. And hold that thou wilt bear hatfuls, hatfuls, three bushel bagfuls, and a little leaf under the stair. When I think about gardens, it's just always so wonderful realising the joy and the spirit that they bring. And it isn't just the greenery that can do that. Our gardens can sometimes seem bleak in the winter months. Three cheers for the old apple tree. But as this orchard is done here, this is often a time where they can bring a lot of hope and cheer. And that's also illustrated superbly in the Bishop's Palace Garden. As well as the foliage and stunning flowers here, beautiful pieces of glass add colour and sparkle in the sunlight. They've been created by artist-in-residence Edgar Phillips, who's invited me into his workshop in one of the old bastion towers. So, Edgar, what are you doing right now? I am painting a dahlia, the Bishop Price dahlia. Ah, yeah. oh, very nice. So the last bishop. Yes, exactly that. I'll get you to have a go in a minute. Oh, Lord. Yeah. <laughs> so here you are doing this stained glass. What? what? What brings you here? Why are you doing it here in the Bishop's Garden? Ah, that's a, um, I lived very nearby and uh, 
I went through a very, very difficult time in my life. And I used to watch the swans uh, landing on the moat. Yeah. Uh, I had no connection to the palace at the time, other than the fact that it gave me peace. Yeah. And at my worst moment, yeah. in my head, just burnt a vision. I've never had one again. I've never had one before. A vision of a big pair of wings. And I was like, oh, I know what I'm going to do. The bishop kindly put on an exhibition here called Light Shining in Darkness. And uh, it basically saved my life. <laughs> but it was something in the atmosphere and the character of the place, was it, do you think, that... that Without doubt... ..brought the, you round? Yes, the flora and the fauna of the palace yeah. brought me peace. It's funny, because we've been talking about the life that water sustains and looking around the gardens, but actually also the fact that it's sort of empowered you to choose life, to coin a phrase. Choose love. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, it did. OK, Xander, I think that's about it. OK. Would you like to have a go? Yeah. I'm going to give you a badger brush here. You hold that in one okay. hand. You Got it? Got it? Yeah. yeah I now, think what so. you're going to do, just give it a motion like that to smooth it out. That's it. Up and down, back and then along, and then, and then stab it. All the way around. Yeah, they see, see what we're doing. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I see. And then all this texture then shines through the unpainted bits on the other side. Exactly. And a bit of this. That's it. That's exactly what you do. Mate, you're a natural. Do you want a job? <laughs> I tell you, I'd work <laughs> here in a heartbeat. Excellent. And it's ready to go in the kiln. And this is the kiln here. This Look is the this. kiln, yes. It's like a big photocopier. At 700 degrees, the colours stain and fuse to the glass. It's a process that's been used for centuries. Once known as the poor man's Bible, stained glass was used to convey the Christian message to illiterate brethren and to enhance the beauty of holy buildings. I can only hope that our floral masterpiece has the same uplifting effect. Here we go, hopefully it's in one piece. Is it sometimes not? Yes. Oh, really? You tell me if it is. Yes, in one piece. Ah! And so what? And you'll see now. I don't know what you can see now, but you can look see. Look at that. Oh, there you go. Look, 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 look. Oh, that's lovely. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> There's something about bright colours that does lift your spirits, especially at this time of year. And I think this garden is a fantastic example of how gardens can renew and invigorate all those who walk within them. A wonderful Easter message. Of course, we can in turn also inject new life into a garden. Arit's been visiting another sacred place, which has been, and continues to be, rejuvenated. Near the city of Perth in Scotland is another palace, which was once a place where kings were crowned under God and man. How lucky am I to start my morning in such a fantastic setting. I'm here in Schoon in Perthshire, or is it Scone? or even scone, it depends how you pronounce it, but it doesn't matter because I'm here to find out about all of the history that has run through these amazing gardens. Fifteen hundred years ago, this splendid 100 acre estate was the capital of an ancient kingdom, ruled over by tribes called the Picts. It was also an important seat of the Celtic church and later became the coronation site for Scottish kings, including Macbeth and Robert the Bruce. Here to tell me more is head gardener Brian Cunningham, the man in charge of maintaining these amazing grounds. Hello. Hi there. Good to meet you, Brian. Welcome to Scoon. Oh, I'm glad you said it was Scoon, because I wasn't sure if it was Scone 
A scone. No, definitely a scone. It's scone. Now, I understand that this is a very special part of the gardens. Yep, so you are right here now on Moot Hill. Right. On Boot Hill. Okay. And this is where the Kings of Scotland were used to be crowned. Wow. Why exactly was it here, though? So a thousand years ago, Schoon was also an important site for religion. Mm -hmm. And just down there, uh -huh. that's where Schoon Abbey used to sit. Oh. So for the ceremony, the monks would then bring the king making seat over to here. Mm -hmm. The reason it's called Moot Hill or Boot Hill is because all the noblemen used to come from around the country. It was deemed too dangerous for the king to go around the whole country. Right. So they would all descend on Schoon Palace. Yes. With them, a boot full of soil from their own land, oh. tip it out, and then that's where the enthronement happened. Wow. Amazing, amazing. And, and this, what we've got here? Well, here we have a nice seat for you. This is our king-making seat. Wow. Am I allowed to sit? Please. <gasps> I feel very honoured. Have you got my crown ready? I know. I should have prepared. <laughs> should have prepared. So I'm sitting on the very spot that for nearly a thousand years kings have been anointed. Yes. But this is just a replica stone. Okay. I've if you cast your mind back, 1296, King Edward, he came up and he actually stole her seat. Oh. And he took it down to Westminster. That's a bit rude. <laughs> <laughs> and then that's where all the coronations take place from then. But the real seat is supposed to be in Edinburgh, but he did come back a further two times. So he was obviously unsure whether the monks hadn't duped him. So, I guess the question is, where do we think that real stone might be? Ah, well, I've heard a few stories. So we've got Schoon Island down on the Tay. I've uh -huh. heard it's been buried in there. Every time we plant a tree around the gardens, we're mm -hmm. kind of hoping we hit that <laughs> bit of stone and find it. But actually, I think it's in there. Mm. I think it's part of the foundations of that palace. Which would be lovely, but I guess we'll never know. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> but Schoon's importance goes back further even than the original stone. When it was the capital of the ancient Pictish kingdom, it was here that King Necton declared that Easter should be observed according to the Roman, not Celtic, calendar. So the reason that today is Easter Sunday in Scotland is because of something that happened right here. Mind-blowing. It's hard to imagine what Scone would have been like back then. The Picts left no written records, but what they did leave are some very intriguing carvings, as Alexander's been discovering. I've come just 15 miles west of Schoon to see a superb example of Pictish art inside Fowlis Wester Church. So it's a lovely little church, isn't it? I'm meeting stone carver David McGovern to learn how to interpret these markings. And there it is. There it is. It's uh, magnificent, isn't it? What exactly are we, are we looking at here, David? We're looking at a Christian cross. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, it's the tallest of the Pictish crosses that has Pictish symbols on it. Well, it's very, it's very beautiful, it's very striking. But what was its, what was its function? It's a good question. Um, it would possibly be to, uh, to gather people together, you know, to hear the... the, the I see. To hear uh, Christian, uh, Christian so stories. It, it marks a point. I'm, it's a kind of altar in some ways, you might say. Absolutely. And when we start building churches, we stop putting monuments like this up in the landscape because a church performs that function, that gathering place to get people together to hear the, the, the stories and tales. Goodness. But it's the intriguing symbols on the other side of the stone that really reveal its cultural heritage. Goodness. Now this is where we get very, very distinctively into Pictish art. Yes. So if I talk you through what we see uh, roughly from the top, We've got a symbol that we call the double disc. Um, we don't know what it means, but it obviously meant something very important in Pictish times, maybe territorial. Yeah. And then we've got uh, a rider on the horse with a very aristocratic high step uh, to the horse. And it's telling us that he had a great control over the horse. He was a great, great horseman. And then it got a lot of cattle uh, being moved uh, and the, accompanied by these chaps with shields and the expressions on these faces are wonderful. Look at even after all this time, yeah. and with the obvious erosion on the stone, you can see the strong features, you know, the beard and the nose. And then down here, we've got a, another Pictish symbol, uh, and this is a, a, what we call a crescent and V-rod. So you can see the crescent yeah. shape yeah, and the V-rod 
Uh, the Christ uh, and the I mean, this, uh, on this side. This feels so ancient, doesn't it? This side. Though. Absolutely, but this feels like the fun side. This is this the, is definitely this, the fun this side. This is the expressive side. But uh, there's a kind of there's a kind of Janus role here. There's two sides to this. This side sort of looks back to a kind of ancient Pictish tradition. That side looks forward to Christianity. You're absolutely right. And uh, one of the most interesting things about Pictish art is the uh, the fact that the Pictish symbols although they appear on stones that predate the arrival of Christianity here, are then tolerated yeah, on the Pictish stones moving forward, generally on the other side from the cross. I just think that's probably a very unifying and tactically significant thing. Absolutely, but it's... To bring it, these it's two strains together. It's incredibly interesting, isn't, isn't it? it, that they're tolerated in that way. Yeah. It's been 1,200 years since these carvings were made. But I can't help but think there's a lesson here for today. We may all have a different spiritual outlook on the world, but like the two sides of this ancient stone, we can still live together in harmony. Outside the church, David has offered to let me experience this remarkable craft myself. David, you're going to now teach me how to, <laughs> how to carve this this stone. We are. So we're going to carve a Pictish symbol, a crescent and V-rod. Okay. So if you pick up the, uh, the hammer there, and uh, to hold the chisel, if you balance it pretty much at the base of your fingers, right? Yeah, and then wrap all of your fingers and your thumb around it and rotate, you'll be ready to carve. So give that okay. a shot. So it's that. Chisel the other way. Oh, chisel the other way. <laughs> like that. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. There and keep go. your Got thumb it. on that side. That's perfect. So if you get the, the chisel point uh, at about a 45 degree angle to the okay. surface that we like want to keep. Okay. Yeah, like uh, that. If you, yeah, if you start tapping through the stone. Now if you move around with me, ah. because you can't carve half-heartedly or standing still. So if you get moving, that's it. Uh, Watch the angle of that chisel. Oh dear, oh dear. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's okay. Absolutely. But it's still uh, outside the line. That's I the see. Key I've started to dig, dig a little bit deeper there. <laughs> I have yeah. stayed outside the lines. That's it. So if you go over, go over that again, that's it. Just tap it through. I'm starting to... <laughs> I'm literally, literally, I've been doing this for a minute now, and already I'm an, I'm an enthusiast, David. Well, wonderful. There's something about the fact that it's, it's not a static business. You know, you're moving with it. You're moving with the design. You do, and it's, it's very dynamic. It's a very strong uh, artistic style. The thing for me is to, to keep it alive by constantly recreating things that uh, conform in some way to the conventions uh, and the, the, the design ideas of Pictish art, but creating brand new things and brand new stories, because that's what the stones did, they told the story. That's exactly what they were, weren't they? I mean, I suppose in, in pre-literate days, you know, the, 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 the Pictish designs on the back of the cross, for example, that's the basis of a story for generations of people to... Absolutely, and I think a stone that had a biblical scene, um, they didn't carve that scene because they thought it was going to look bonny. They carved it so that people would gather at the stone and, and hear the story uh, as you say, in pre-literate times. So, you know, that's what it's for. These are storytelling monuments. That's interesting. Yeah. You keep into a nice line there. That's nice and tidy in the, in the crest there. Please, you notice that. Yeah. I think it might be another thousand years before I'm able to produce anything as impressive as the carved stone. But it's inspiring to know that David's keeping the Pictish legacy alive. Sadly, there are none of these Pictish monuments left at Schoon Palace, but other stories of hope and inspiration can be found woven throughout the garden. Like this gigantic Douglas fir, named after the famous botanist David Douglas, who rose from being an undergardener here to become an internationally renowned plant collector. But most of Schoon's truly outstanding trees are found in the collection of conifers known as the Pinetum. Here, North American giants such as the noble fir have stood for over 150 years. But now some of them are showing their age. But what better time to look for renewal than Easter? I've come to lend a hand to Adam Reedy, who's checking up on a huge Western hemlock tree. So what exactly are we doing here? So we're just setting up the, an ultrasound scan of this tree to see how much decay is within the trunk. 
That's amazing. So we have to kind of set this up all the yes. way around. Okay, so that that links onto there. Yep. Okay, guys, so we've got the setup. What's next? So now all the sensors are connected to each other. Yeah. So now we're ready to start the test. Okay. Each of the 12 sensors is connected to a nail. And as we work our way around the tree, I tap each nail three yep. times Perfect. with the hammer, which again seems strangely symbolic at Easter. Perfect. Okay. So the tapping is starting to build the picture. Yes, so the computer knows the distance between all these tapping points. So hard, solid wood is a good medium for the sound path to travel through. Uh, the decayed wood or the altered wood, there's more stuttering, there's more delay. So eventually, from these sound paths, we'll be able to generate a picture, essentially. Right. Yeah, a picture of sound. While we've been tapping away, I've noticed some odd-looking growths on the bark of the tree. So is that like a fungi? It's a fungi, yeah. yeah. So it may be an encouraging sign that it's so big, suggesting that there may still be some wood left in there, yeah. that there's still a food source. I think when the, the fungi become black and shriveled and they've all died off, uh, we really... We know might... it's game over. Yes, yeah. potentially, yeah. So, yes, last three, last if you three. wouldn't mind. That's great, Eric. Perfect. OK. So... Moment of truth. Let's see how you're doing. So the picture we can see on this field computer is a little provisional. From a first look, it's quite shocking. It seems like there's an awful lot of decay, these blue and white colours. <gasps> Initially, is. it's highly suggestive in the interior here. There may just be no wood left at all. Oh. But my suspicion is when we get back to the office, we'll see much more living, intact sapwood uh, surrounding the whole, the whole trunk. Mm -hmm. What does that mean for you, Brian? It's a bit sad, isn't it? Mm. But um, it's not the end of the road. It may just mean crown reduction, mm. but I'm quite sure every visitor that pays money to come into these gardens would want to see those trees still here yeah. and not on the ground. Well, thank you for allowing me to, to tree tap. Yeah. Obviously, it would have been great if the picture had been all good. Yeah, fingers crossed. Yeah. Hopefully, there's hope. Yeah. yeah, there's still time. Incredibly, these aren't the oldest trees on the estate. At the back left corner of the house is a sycamore that's been standing for 400 years. It was planted by King James VI of Scotland, after whom the King James Version of the Bible is named. Even though he planted this tree here at Schoon, James wasn't crowned here in the traditional way, but in a Protestant coronation not far from here in Stirling, in one of the nation's most historic cemetery gardens. This is Holy Rood, meaning Holy Cross, and it's the only church to have held a coronation that's still being used, apart from Westminster, of course. But it's the surrounding grounds that I've come to see today. This may look like a sinister area you want to avoid visiting, but for many, this has been a place for enjoyment and spiritual education, and it still is. I'm taking a walk with archaeologist Dr Murray Cook to find out how this space, just like a garden, enlightens its visitors. So Murray, tell us where we are now. Well, this is the Valley Cemetery, yeah. um, right in the heart of Stirling. This is both a purpose-built cemetery and a purpose-built pleasure ground. Um, every aspect is designed. The carriageway, the paths, the planting schemes, the trees. How new is that as a concept, uh, the idea of, of a, a pleasure being in amongst, well, in, in amongst the dead? I mean, it's not, it's, it strikes me as a, a, as a peculiar thing. Yes, so in the 19th century, as people move, they have, they have greater liberty, they have more money. There's a concern amongst the, the elite that what are people doing with this money? What are they doing with the time off? 
Somewhere like this was actually just kind of wild public space. People drank here, they played football right. here. Yeah. They didn't necessarily go to church on Sunday. So this space is meant to provide an example of how you should lead your life. Besides being a beautiful public park, there are some distinctly Protestant messages instilled within this design, and some are more obvious than others. So quite a lot of features around here, Murray. Yes. Uh, talk me through some of the salient ones. Well, this is the valley. So obviously yeah. there are valley sides. To my left is Ladies Rock. On, the, on our right, the big pyramid, Salem Rock. Another uh, monument to religious and political freedom. And then framed right in the middle are Protestant reformers and we have Knox right in the middle that led the Reformation in the 16th century. I see. And the paths, is there, is there, a, is there a symbolism within the paths themselves? Well, that... there is a feeling that there is a straight and narrow in the cemetery. There's also a straight and narrow on Ladies Rock. And then there are two false paths. That, oh. So that these lead to dead ends. Oh. So <laughs> there we are. Yes. There's a the symbolism. Yes. I mean, there's a lot wrapped up in here. Um, I dare say, for future generations to come and unravel all of these, all of the symbolism must be, that's going to be great fun. Future Dan Browns. <laughs> I don't think I'll be spending all my free time in graveyards, but I have to say there's something about being surrounded by death that does make you contemplate life. After all, there are symbols of mortality and immortality, including skulls and foliage, everywhere. Being optimistic, as we are on Easter Sunday, you could think of cemeteries as a celebration of lives well lived. And what better way to spend your life than enjoying a garden? Back at Scone Palace, the celebration of new life in a garden is being observed in the newly restored Ward Kitchen Garden, where they've asked me to help out. So what's the plan today then? So we're on leeks today, so yes. we're needing for soup this time of year. Okay. okay. So all we need to do is just gently go around behind them and then slowly tease them up. That's it. And then hey ho, there we go. Good stuff. In my experience as a garden designer, working in a garden can do wonders for the soul. And it seems that no matter what the size or history of the site, that's a feeling shared by everyone who tends to a garden. So how long have you been coming down to the gardens volunteering? Just over a year since I started yeah. and I uh, really enjoyed it here. We made a lot of progress in that time yeah. and it's just so satisfying to, to see the thing change and develop and be so productive as this. Was you keen gardeners before or is it, have you learned everything here? Oh, I've always enjoyed gardening since I was about this high yeah. and when I moved up here I downsized a lot especially yeah. the garden mm -hmm. so when I was able to come here I now say to people I've got one of the biggest gardens <laughs> in the area you know <laughs> and it's, it's just great just to get out and about yeah. in the fresh air. So Ryan has done this amazing job here but what's the rolling plans for the future? Basically just bring the garden back to the 21st century. I mean, it, it is an amazing space. And, and the layout here for when the garden was laid out in the 1800s, you know, yeah. it's pretty much here. You know, we've, we've got the kitchen garden, yeah. you've got the historical aspect around the palace, a Victorian pinetum. So we're just trying to bring it all back to life. Well, if you need any help, you can always give me a shout back, as long as I've got leek soup on the go. Oh, definitely. You can go home with yeah. a whole load of produce. OK, that's a deal. Best get going then. <laughs> <laughs> If gardens are central to the Easter story and reflect the idea of new life and rebirth as we've seen it at the Bishop's Palace and Schoon Palace, I wonder if there's a garden that expresses a feeling of pure joy like that felt by Christians after the resurrection. Alexander's found one which might well fit the bill. In Northumberland, just 25 miles south of the holy island of Lindisfarne, is the impressive Annick Garden in the market town of Annick. Oh, 
I grew up not very far from here. We used to come to Annick the whole time. What makes this garden different from many of the gardens we've seen is that this isn't a private garden, it's not a monastic retreat. The aim of this garden, pure and simple, is to be a people's garden, which makes it the perfect place for us to conclude our Easter Sunday. Spread over 12 sloping acres, the Annick Garden has some spectacular plantings and some dramatic installations, like the central Grand Cascade, which circulates 250,000 gallons of water. But what makes it a people's garden? I've come to meet head gardener Trevor Jones in a part of the garden that has a surprising religious association with temptation at its heart. Well, Trevor, I mean, there are lots of different bits of this garden. What's the, what are we in now? This part of the garden is called the Serpent Garden. Can you imagine why it might be the Serpent I, Garden? <laughs> I was just thinking, I see no, I see no snakes, but yeah, as well, I just ah. spotted this yew here. Yes, yeah, so we have this yew hedge that snakes its way through the garden. Yes. And this is the serpent's tail. And on either side of the serpent, we have a different water feature. And all of these oh. water features are interactive, so we encourage people to play with them and learn by them. So it's supposed to be a fun area of the garden. This, this is kind of part and parcel of the garden's ethos, isn't it? I mean, it is, really. There's education behind everything that we do here in the garden. Yeah. So if you're studying physics, why sit in a classroom and learn at a desk where you can come into the garden and learn all about water movement here in the Serpent Garden? Much more fun. What is a farm but a mute gospel? There indeed. we are. <laughs> indeed. <laughs> and you don't have to be here for very long before you just get it. In fact, funny enough, it was walking around this serpent garden with our kids yeah. that I suddenly thought, ah, oh, yeah. this is, yeah. I get what this, uh, yeah. I really get it. Yeah. Uh, which is great, and that's what it's all about, really. We're talking about interactive experience. This, uh, this fountain's just shot off while we were walking past it. This is one enough. of the best water features, I think, in the garden, and yeah. children love it. And it works with water pressure. Yeah. So water fills the stainless steel tube until it overflows. Yeah. And then once you've got a head of pressure, it manoeuvres a valve underneath, which releases the pressure and all the water shoots <laughs> that up. That it all comes. And, you know, there's nowhere here where I've seen a sign that says, please keep off the grass or, yeah. you know, please do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that. It's just, it's a wonderful sense of it being... It is. There are no the signs in the garden at yeah. all. We encourage people just to use their imagination as they go around, experience the whole garden as it is without being directed to point A and point B. Yeah. Lovely. For me to experience for myself the ethos of this garden, Trevor's invited me to join a tour of a part of the garden that's kept under lock and key. In this garden, that's all about celebrating life, this place, it seems, is all about death. Everywhere here, the emphasis is all on fun, even here at the Poison Garden. Good morning, folks. Everybody ready for a Poison Garden tour? Yes. Now, before I take you in, can I please ask you not to touch any of the plants, not to smell any of the plants, stand too close to any of the plants, because they all have the ability to do you harm. And in fact, some will actually kill you. Ooh. <laughs> I'll let you in. <laughs> the Poison Garden is packed with dangerous plants, from opium poppies to mandrakes and even has a license from the Home Office to grow cannabis and coca. But there are also some plants that we gardeners may be more familiar with. This is laurel. Now, many of us grow laurel in our garden as hedging material, because it's ideal, it's evergreen, grows fairly quickly. But how many of you know that laurel produces cyanide? So, come on down this way, there's more to be seen. If you come on down, it gets worse. <laughs> <laughs> so, this plant here is called Atropa belladonna, or deadly nightshade. Very deadly, but it also has a good side, because Atropa produces atropine. Atropine is used in eye surgery, because it will dilate the pupil to help the surgeons operating on eyes. So, some plants have good as well as very sinister dark sides. I'll now open the gate and let you all out. Thank you very much for your support. I get a sense it would be dangerous to get on the wrong side of Trevor. He's done a fantastic job of creating spaces to educate and entertain. 
But what good is a people's garden without the people? I want to find out what this garden means to the community. So I've rallied a group together to get a bit of local insight. What do you love about the garden? Uh, oh, just the atmosphere and, and the, the beauty of the place, the water features, of course, for the yeah, boys. Yeah. It's nice to um, see your water fountains. What do you think it's done for the community? It's garden. a centre to yes. come together and yeah. meet. I guess for friendships, yeah. Friendships, yeah. Yes. And you've really felt that. You've yes. felt that happen yes. over the come, last. You can come on your own, and yeah. you invariably you meet somebody, yeah. and you have a common interest in the exactly. garden, <laughs> and have a, have a, a good conversation, and you go away with a smile on your face. And what could be better than that? This wonderful garden sends a message about the pure joy a garden can bring—a sort of garden evangelism, if you like. But it wasn't always like that, as Aritz has been discovering. For centuries, this garden was part of the extensive Northumberland estate surrounding Annick Castle just next door. It was a place reserved for the castle's noble owners and their guests, shut off from the surrounding community. But in 1996, all that changed when the current Duchess of Northumberland, Jane, decided to make a garden with a difference. I've come to the geometric ornamental garden to meet her. Garden, I have to say, Jane, looks so gorgeous. It's really established. Well, it wasn't always like that. Oh. Um, it was a forestry garden. There were trees just in rows here but I could see the bones of it mm -hmm. then. Mm -hmm. um, and also, you know, it's surrounded by the town, yeah. so it, uh, it made sense to do something with it and pulled them all out <laughs> and, and started, redesigned it, and this is the result. Oh, well, it's very brave of you to do that. But, I mean, there's a lot of formality to the garden, you know, the sort of pleach trees and the straight lines, but at the same time, I have to say, it does feel very relaxed in here and very calm. Well, th that's a really interesting point you've made because all the time I was thinking that this had to make people in the northeast feel that this was theirs and that this was a place that wasn't too sort of flashy. It, it was somewhere that was comfortable and all the benches were designed yeah. so you could put a cup of tea on the side and bring yeah. in a flask <laughs> and sit for a day with a newspaper if you wanted to. Oh, lovely. I can see it's very passionate mm. about how people mm interact with the space, how they feel in the space. And I guess it's that, that healing aspect. Is that something that you've observed? In so many ways, I've seen how people can be healed or have their life enhanced by, by the Annick Gardens. We have programs for those suffering from dementia or Alzheimer's, yes. uh, older people who just come and walk through the garden and get a bit of exercise, children who don't know that a carrot is grown in the ground. <laughs> and I mean, that's, that's what it's all about. Yeah. It's, uh, it's important to me. Now the garden is run as a charity, bringing the joy of a garden to young and old alike. To see how these initiatives work firsthand, I've come to the Roots and Shoots Garden, where a team of local school children are getting their hands dirty. Right, guys, welcome to Anna Garden. I'm going to be your gardener for the day. My name's George. Today, hiya. So, hi, George. Hi. Hi, Alexander. <laughs> Luckily, George has the patience of a saint and shows us all how to plant out onion seedlings. So everyone gets a cell tray, right? Yes. You're gonna get some compost, and you're gonna crumble it up, like that. Take a hold of an onion seedling very gently at the top, and gently pull it, and just dig it up. Ooh, look See, at that. See, it's got roots on there. And you put one into there. So eventually, you fill up your six cells on your tray. Okay, I'm gonna race you. Oh, I've been squeezing the lumps out. <laughs> yeah. Oh, look at that. That's a good one. Oh, you put this one upside down. <laughs> Beautifully done. I can't deny that this is a lot of fun, 
But this project aims to do much more than spread joy. Tracy McNicky's on hand to tell me more. So Tracy, this, I mean, this is incredible. It is, yeah. It's a wonderful program. And you know that there's so many facets to the program as well. Yeah. A lot of it looks around um, childhood obesity. And you know, for some children, the first time they lay eyes on fruit and veggies out of a, a freezer or a packet. So to well, be able to have this experience of growing it themselves, um, and seeing where their produce comes from. Actually being able, to, having license to get your so hands sensory. dirty. So sensory, it is, I mean? it is, yes. Fill up trays with, with compost like that. Uh, permission to make a mess. I mean, permission yeah. to make a mess, yeah. but also permission to start something that they can then watch day by That's day. Right. I mean, it's a... It's engaging. Mm -hmm. It's a soap opera right Absolutely. there in a, in a pot, and it, isn't it gives them some ownership and responsibility as well. Yeah. And yeah, it is. It's, it's quite a miracle for them to be able to see. Well, it those. is. Yeah, yeah, it is. And actually, at the other end of it, you can cut that up and eat it. I, for one, can't wait to see how these miraculous onion stories unfold, and whether any of my seedlings will make it to the kitchen table. So, everybody, have we all learnt something today? We have. For me, Annick is a wonderful example of how gardens can transform their visitors, whether you're six or 60. And I think that's a fitting message to end our Easter Sunday. We began in the Bishop's Palace Garden when new life flowed in through crystal clear water. Visited the historic garden at Schoon Palace that was being given a new lease of life. And finally, the Annick Garden, where humor and compassion flourish. When Bishop Peter said the garden was at the heart of Easter, it seems he was right. From Scotland to Somerset, we've seen how they can reflect the promise of new life. Yes, and we found that they bring us joy and hold our memories and make us feel totally alive. Heavenly gardens indeed. And so for us, it's time to say goodbye and happy, happy Easter. Easter. Well, this is the Valley Cemetery. Yeah. Um, right in the heart of Stirling. This is both a purpose-built cemetery and a purpose-built pleasure ground. Um, every aspect is designed. The carriageway, the paths, the planting schemes, the trees. How new is that as a concept, uh, the idea of, of a, a pleasure being in amongst, well, in, in amongst the dead? I mean, it's not, it's, it strikes me as a, a, as a peculiar thing. Yes. I dare say and for future generations to come and unravel all of these, all of the symbolism must be, that's going to be great fun, future Dan Browns. <laughs> I 
I don't think I'll be spending all my free time in graveyards. But I have to say there's something about being surrounded by death that does make you contemplate life. After all, there are symbols of mortality and immortality, including skulls and foliage, everywhere. Being optimistic, as we are on Easter Sunday, you could think of cemeteries as a celebration of lives well lived. And what better way to spend your life than enjoying a garden? Back at Scone Palace, the celebration of new life in a garden is being observed in the newly restored Ward Kitchen Garden, where they've asked me to help out. So what's the plan today then? So we're on leeks today, so yes. we're needing for soup this time of year. Okay. okay. So all we need to do is just gently go around behind them and then slowly tease them up. That's it. And then hey ho, there we go. Good stuff. In my experience as a garden designer, working in a garden can do wonders for the soul. And it seems that no matter what the size or history of the site, that's a feeling shared by everyone who tends to a garden. So how long have you been coming down to the gardens volunteering? Just over a year since I started yeah. and I uh, really enjoyed it here. We made a lot of progress in that time yeah. and it's just so satisfying to, to see the thing change and develop and be so productive as this. And was you keen gardeners before or is it, have you learned everything here? Oh, I've always enjoyed gardening since I was about this high. Yeah. And when I moved up here, I downsized a lot, especially yeah. the garden. Mm -hmm. So when I was able to come here, I now say to people, I've got one of the biggest gardens <laughs> in the area, you know. <laughs> and it's, it's just great just to get out and about yeah. in the fresh air. So Ryan has done this amazing job here, but what's the rolling plans for the future? Basically just bring the garden back to the 21st century. I mean, it, it is an amazing space and, and the layout here for when the garden was laid out in the 1800s, you know, yeah. it's pretty much here. You know, we've, we've got the kitchen garden, yeah. you've got the historical aspect around the palace, a Victorian pinetum. So we're just trying to bring it all back to life. Well, if you need any help, you can always give me a shout back, as long as I've got leek soup on the go. Oh, definitely. You can go home with yeah. a whole load of produce. OK, that's a deal. Best get going then. <laughs> <laughs> If gardens are central to the Easter story and reflect the idea of new life and rebirth as we've seen it at the Bishop's Palace and Schoon Palace, I wonder if there's a garden that expresses a feeling of pure joy like that felt by Christians after the resurrection. Alexander's found one which might well fit the bill. In Northumberland, just 25 miles south of the holy island of Lindisfarne, is the impressive Annick Garden in the market town of Annick. I grew up not very far from here. We used to come to Annick the whole time. What makes this garden different from many of the gardens we've seen? is that this isn't a private garden, it's not a monastic retreat. The aim of this garden, pure and simple, is to be a people's garden, which makes it the perfect place for us to conclude our Easter Sunday. Spread over 12 sloping acres, the Annick Garden has some spectacular plantings and some dramatic installations like the central Grand Cascade, which circulates 250,000 gallons of water. But what makes it a people's garden? I've come to meet head gardener Trevor Jones in a part of the garden that has a surprising religious association with temptation at its heart. Well, Trevor, I mean, there are lots of different bits to this garden. What's the, what are we in now? This part of the garden is called the Serpent Garden. Can you imagine why it might be the Serpent I, Garden? <laughs> I was just thinking, I see no, I see no snakes, but yeah, as well, I just ah. spotted this yew here. Yes, yeah, so we have this yew hedge that snakes its way through the garden. Yes. And this is the serpent's tail. And on either side of the serpent, we have a different water feature. And all of these oh. water features are interactive, so we encourage people to play with them and learn by them. 
Is it supposed to be a fun area of the garden? It, this is kind of part and parcel of the garden's ethos, isn't it? I mean, it is, really. There's education behind everything that we do here in the garden. Yeah. So if you're studying physics, why sit in a classroom and learn at a desk where you can come into the garden and learn all about water movement here in the Serpent Garden? Much more fun. What is a farm but a mute gospel? There indeed. we are. <laughs> indeed. <laughs> and you don't have to be here for very long before you just get it. In fact, funny enough, it was walking around this serpent garden with our kids yeah. that I suddenly thought, ah, oh, yeah. this is, yeah, yeah. I get what this, uh, yeah. I really get it. Yeah. Uh, which is great, and that's what it's all about, really. We're talking about interactive experience. This, uh, this fountain's just shot off while we were walking past it. This is one enough. of the best water features, I think, in the garden, and yeah. children love it. And it works with water pressure. Yeah. So water fills the stainless steel tube until it overflows. Yeah. And then once you've got a head of pressure, it manoeuvres a valve underneath, which releases the pressure and all the water shoots <laughs> that up. That it all comes. And, you know, there's nowhere here where I've seen a sign that says, please keep off the grass or, yeah. you know, please do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that. It's just, it's a wonderful sense of it being... It is. There are no the signs in the garden at yeah. all. We encourage people just to use their imagination as they go around, experience the whole garden as it is without being directed to point A and point B. Yeah. Lovely. For me to experience for myself the ethos of this garden, Trevor's invited me to join a tour of a part of the garden that's kept under lock and key. In this garden, that's all about celebrating life, this place, it seems, is all about death. Everywhere here, the emphasis is all on fun, even here at the Poison Garden. Good morning, folks. Everybody ready for a Poison Garden tour? Yes. Now, before I take you in, can I please ask you not to touch any of the plants, not to smell any of the plants, stand too close to any of the plants, because they all have the ability to do you harm. And in fact, some will